2015 marked a crucial year in one of the largest racing game series in history. Need for Speed was the reboot of a name played searching for a new identity. With an entirely new development team and a new set of rules, the revival was off to a rocky start. Both Need for Speed and its sequel Payback were faced with a mixed reception, and the task of resurging love for the series was a taller order than ever before. Enter Need for Speed Heat, a game which on paper had the ball in its court, a familiar yet revamped setting, dark and gritty police, and what looked to be a more unique character. Things were looking good. Or were they? Heat has always been one of the most perplexing Need for Speeds to me. A game in which I could see sparks of greatness in, but could never fall in love with. And in this video, I want to take a look back five years later and show you how Need for Speed Heat could have been great. There's a pet peeve of mine when it comes to games, one that bothers me so much more than something just straight up being bad, and it's games which could have been properly fantastic, yet are inherently limited by constraints of their own fandom or legacy. This has been Need for Speed's crowning fault for going on 10 years now, and while it pains me the most in Unbound, Heat is arguably where this is the most prevalent and impactful, and I'll tell you why. 2015 was an odd and underdeveloped and strange title which owed a lot of its success to creativity devoid nostalgia bait. And this oh so beloved 2015 atmosphere which people love so much. Holy crap, it's real. I will admit, I do have a bit of morbid affection for the cutscenes and ridiculous script, but the game itself left so much to be desired. Payback. Oh boy. We'll be doing a full video on this game soon, so I'll try and keep this one brief. Though Payback, despite all of its many, many flaws, managed to do something different with its bombastic story, which the series hadn't seen since the run in 2011. Heavily took into account the criticism labeled against it, shunning away the aspects which, with a good amount of production and writing firepower, could have been an interesting route to explore the future of the series and try more. But no. This leads us to Heat. Two years after the critically shunned payback, drops us into a premise which, on paper, actually sounds pretty damn awesome. A legal sanctioned racing festival in the daytime which turns into a crime ridden competition fierce cutthroat and corrupt backdrop at night? Hell yeah man, sign me up. If Heat's daytime segments played out as an evolved version of Pro Street's festival, which arguably was the best racing festival that this genre has ever seen, and then included a really heavy, dark, and gritty story which could play out at the nighttime segments of the game, jeez, I mean, you could be looking at one of the best games in the series. But of course, this would seem too good to be true. And in order to better showcase what I both think Heat does really quite well, and its pieces which hold it so far back, Let's move into the world and gameplay of Palm City. Media being derivative is, in the vast majority of the time, an expected and natural reality of how this medium evolves. Most stories, concepts, and worlds have been done before in similar ways. So being derivative in nature is not just the norm, but can be a healthy way to progress and build upon existing concepts, and just doing them better. Now, I preface all of this because the current crux of Need for Speed issues can all be chalked down to over-reliance on attempting to derive the same feelies and punches that the series reached in its communally agreed upon heyday during the 2000s. Of course, as you can guess, Need for Speeds of late have clearly failed to drive not only the success that its podium-setting titles claim, but the communal adoration either. With all of this now being set as our stage, the perfect place to start tackling Heat's missteps would be the world in which we're set in. And boy is it a doozy. Palm City is one that I've always felt never utilized the potential of a game which isn't limited by a 24 hour day and night cycle. Limiting yourself to two distinct times of day leads you to have so much more free reign in stylizing each one to look the best that it possibly can. Yet that's not the case here at all. Heat in the daytime, and I will be brutally honest, is one of the most vapid looking games I have ever played. We are in Miami, and there is nearly no color to be found. Dull grays and muted tones suppress any sort of character this map may have, and it's sad. And this doesn't even go on to mention the whole festival theme. Where is it? There really is no festival activities or even a main site at all here. I mean, imagine a big fusion-like hub of both Forza Horizon 1 and Pro Street's festivals in the corner of a map that you could visit and mess around with. Signs and advertisements all over the place really just building that atmosphere. But yeah, this concept really wasn't utilized at all, was it? 
so the day isn't anything to write home about. But what about when things get dark? Honestly, this is leagues and bounds better. The simple yet effective difference that contrast brings to the table is what really shields the show here. Neon and streetlights piercing through the pitch black at dark of night. See, this is what I'm talking about. Especially when you're in races, the massive step up in sense of speed in which this game has, which I'll get to later, in combination with the in-event effects and lighting, can be a real feast for the eyes. I do almost wonder, however, does the night look that much better simply because you don't have to look at much of this game's map? Boy, that... That got depressing fast. This map itself, looking away from its fierce ends of its presentation spectrum, might just be the most unevocative set of roads and terrain that I've driven on in a game. I can't say that this map is bad, or poorly designed, because I really don't think that it is. It's more so a case of it being so... fine, that I can hardly bring up any points of contention here. There's very little to praise apart from some of its nighttime presentation. Function over form is a subject that I well and truly understand, but for a game as need for speed, lacking on that form front, especially in a game which has such sparks of brilliant presentation, is a proper shame. That last note there is something I do want to take time to appreciate, because while I have my quibbles with heat, there are some sparks of greatness in here which I can't help but properly love. It's all of the little things, man, like menus. Yeah, yeah, okay, here I go talking about menus again, but just look at this pause menu. Heat loves to paint around with its lighting, and mix that with the pretty sick trend in recent games which pause the menu right around your car in motion? This is just plain badass. Even traditional boring loading screens with a few screenshots don't exist here. It all revolves around your current car, cutting to all forms of cinematic shots and colors. And with those cars themselves, I've always loved the more bombastic approach that Need for Speed's taken towards making them feel way more rad than they actually are. The backfires in this game are so over the top, but that's what I love. The sounds are more crass and violent than they are realistic. The sense of speed. God, this is so sorely missed in many another series, but smack the nitrous and your camera flies on back, giving that feeling of g-force which doesn't get old. Dynamic cameras as well are right in contention for some of the most important tools to craft a game's feel. Games like God of War in the past used them to showcase scale, but for racers, it uses that to accentuate your driving, and he does that properly well if you ask me. I want to stay on that topic of cars and heat because they're honestly some of the best that you'll get in recent games. The selection itself was a solid step up from Payback, and it's clear that the Miami setting was definitely taken into scope when adding all sorts of new supercars and really top tier rides. But I respect the series' lineage of keeping a good old mix of not just older cars, but the slower stuff as well. It's hard not to appreciate how this roster, which, while smaller than a lot of the competitors, is pretty chock full of some mostly really good stuff, and this in turn helps you build a solid connection with the cars that you're going to be using throughout the game. Personalizing and building a connection with your cars is something that Heat really puts into focus. These games really don't put a focus on having an encyclopedic collection of cars, just having a set view in which you can build to fill the desired roles in your garage. And throughout your career and time with Heat, it is truly commendable how dedicated these games are to not only attaching yourself to a small pool of vehicles, but really making the effort that you put into gaining those high-end cars so damn worth it. See, they aren't just locked behind cash, you'll have to earn enough rep to unlock the ability to purchase a lot of them. And I find this to scale alongside your main campaign progression really solid. And even once you're done, hitting the highest level rep will take a good amount of work for you post-game. So unlocking that real upper echelon really means something. While it's not necessarily for me, I've gotta say that I respect the amount of visual customization options that Heat gives you. There's real benefits for even those who like to keep builds more subtle. Things like swappable brake calipers, head and tail lights, tires, all add up into making the perfect build for everyone. Even the body kits and excessive wings and canards. While yeah, they're a lot, it's not what I would call gaudy. And most of these come from a really good selection of aftermarket manufacturers. And hell, Need for Speed still to my knowledge is the only racer that lets you use stickers and decals on glass, and has the most extensive selection of those aforementioned decals. Hell, the fact that you can tune your exhaust note and levels of backfires and pops, and how they sound, it's really hard not to commend the work done for personalization. 
Things get better once again with the all-new upgrade system that Heat brought in. Paybacks was infamously one of, if not, the worst upgrade system in racing game history. And that feedback really did shape this game, as what we've ended up with is, while simple, pretty much what you would expect. Very typical Need for Speed part categories which will unlock higher tiers based on how high your up level is. Keep it simple, no need to do anything drastic, and I respect that. If I could ask for anything, it would have been really neat to see a mixture of both this and what we had in either Rivals or Hot Pursuit with their counter weapons, as we only really have defensive options when it comes to dealing with the police. But, while there is plenty of good to be said about Heat's cars, there's a catch. While all of this personalization and customization is great, I'd like to play devil's advocate for a second and just reminisce on something that I've always felt this customization focused style since 2015 has led to, and that's a lack of proper gameplay. The physics on hand have never really been anything all that special. There's no real quirks to any of it, and what I've always felt is a lack of weight or roll. Things feel a bit too safe and easy. There isn't much differentiation or pros and cons to having a grip or focus build, or one that focuses on drifting. It's a similar situation to how I think of this game's map. Yeah, the physics are fine, but again, that's just it. They're fine. All of the drama comes from how they're presented in the slick camera work. Actually executing any sort of maneuvers doesn't take much skill or learning. It's intuitive almost to a fault. This of course isn't to say that it can't be fun, the break to drift nature leads to some pretty great close slides and technical sweepers, but I can't help but yearn for something more involved and weighty, one for the cars feel quite different to one another. And where I found this change in Need for Speed's focus to have affected the game the most is through the real meat of its gameplay. Let's face it, differentiating racing games can be damn hard. There's only so much you can do with cars and finish lines that feels new and exciting. But that's what makes it hit that much harder when you find a game that actually does give you these engaging new modes or ways to use your cars that you haven't done before. This is what, for me, set apart those golden era need for speeds. Drag racing was so different to your standard races, with things like toll boots, knockouts, speed traps. Hell, I can go on. I bring up again, Derivative. Heat's main gameplay roots follow a very typical structure to that of its predecessors. But how exactly has it evolved this formula? And the answer is, well it hasn't. If anything, it's actually gone quite backwards. For events, we have races, we have time trials, drift trials, and that's it man. Of course we have high heat modifiers for most of these, but again that just ups the intensity. I've been saying for the longest time now, if Need for Speed can find a balance between having this great effort into car personalization, upgrading and tuning, and then mix that with properly engaging and varied events, dude, these could be some of the best damn racers out there. And when you look at how good these existing modes are, they are solid. The issue is, they're just too oversaturated. There's too much of each one and too little of anything different. And the only thing that really is different are the off-road races, which I will be the first one to say, these suck. Let's keep these series on the roads please, as cop-out and half-baked off-road races just don't do it. Now, I want to be a little more lenient here, as there is something that Heat tremendously improved on, and that is these goddamn cops. I'm gonna be straight up, man. I had a pretty damn good blast going back and replaying this one and getting into the cop chases. Because the stakes here are damn real. Sure, this isn't rivals level, but hot damn man, these cops don't play around. And there's a proper sense of risk versus reward, as you can, and you truly will, lose all of your hard work if you mess around too much on higher heat levels and leave yourself gutted. Which is great! If there was one little tidbit to add to the police and chases though, aside from weapons like I mentioned before, Pursuit Breakers just feel like such an obvious missed opportunity, as the only real way to take out your pursuers is cheesing them off of ramps, which... it just breaks the immersion. It's so much more natural and just straight up fun, hounding a fleet of police cars after you only to drop a water tower or a gas station onto their path and laying low on your way to a hideout. So as you can see, it's again a case of while yes, there are absolutely some real things to like about Heat, can I honestly say that this matches up qualitatively to games in its legacy? No, I can't. It's not just about quality, but quantity as well. This game could have seriously benefited from meaningful variation and some trailblazing new concepts to bring to the gameplay front. And if you thought this game's campaign would have been there to lift this game back up, do I ever have news for you?
Now, as I've said earlier on and throughout this video, heat itself is a real wrench in the mix of Need for Speed's fundamental issues and their derivative nature. And if you ask me, where this glares out the most is through its narrative. Call me insane, and I may even agree, but Payback beforehand, while utterly stupid and bombastic, was at least out of the box for this franchise, and I can almost respect that. Payback's campaign, for better or worse, will stick with you, and it's because it's something different for this franchise, inspired by more recent Fast and Furious movies and the action genre as a whole. Heat on Paper is a game that you would think, based on its premise, would continue this path of straying away from its legacy's past. With the unique take of both structured, regulated races and addendum to the existing illegal street racing trope, the field in which to grow and carve out new stories and structure was vast. Yet what we ended up with is another derivative of stories past, told worse, again. And to clarify for those of you typing an essay right now, I am not at all trying to say stories regarding illegal street racing aren't interesting. It's the issue of trying to replicate and capture a golden era of Need for Speed which simply does not work in a modern environment. If these stories evolved with the production and writing quality of the rest of the industry, hell yeah, I'm down. Yet they don't, and in both interest of fun and retrospective, I wanted to go through Heat's story and go through exactly what it got right and the many faults as well. Our story begins with some simple exposition for our stage to be set. Street racing is ever present throughout the streets of Palm City. And in an effort to stop this crisis, the police department allowed sanctioned races to take place through the daytime hours. I've mentioned before how this concept isn't exactly handled the best, yet it's clearly also not working as these events completely Cobra affected this strategy and striked an even larger crisis of underground illegal races which happen at the night. It's crazy how not once did the police department think, ah, hey guys, maybe it's the best idea to make it illegal at all times just to cut down on all this all. Nope, but they just continue feeding the dog which bites their hand. Great idea. I just solved the entire game's crisis in 10 seconds. Brilliant writing. Anyways, we flash back a few days where evil cops are being evil, crashing out a street racer whose car falls right into the sea. As they kick the poor guy while he's down, they divulge how much of a shame it is they lost the car. Good lord, these guys are meant. The shoo-in cop lower rank than all the others with morals tells the goofballs that they're on camera and the big bad erases the footage, while going full Shadow the Hedgehog with his it's about sending a message. I will say though, as a bit of a side note, for a game in this niche, the character models and animation work are really impressive. This may be a god awful story, but hell if they didn't pour some money into presenting it. Flash forward? We really aren't told where exactly in the timeline this is, but I'm assuming modern day, to the Rivera family garage. As we step into the shoes of... we don't know yet, we're just seeing through the eyes of someone while we meet Lucas. Yeah, Lucas. The game doesn't introduce him, the protagonist just somehow knows his name already. Uh, fantastic introduction there. We cut to a quick character selection screen where you can pick how your protagonist looks, and just for the sake of ease, I'll be calling ours GameCube. That aside, Lucas has some cars up for offer, and honestly, while yeah, limited, the options that you have are pretty solid, albeit generic choices for a first set of wheels. Keys in check, it's time to go to the parts store? There's some really strange cuts and unexplained scene changes all throughout, so we don't really know why we're here. And speaking of strange, don't meet Anna. She's Lucas's sister, and yeah, she's the real protagonist of this game, believe it or not. You'll see what I mean soon enough. Anna says the parts store doesn't just sell to anyone, which is something Lucas should have told us when I'm assuming he sent us over here. Really just strange, contrived meeting of these two characters, but hey, she gives us her phone number, which, and Briz, I guess, and heads off to talk on the phone. This is... This is great writing, this. Alright, this is your first chance to get up playing on your own, and your first set of both standard events and first story missions opens up. The events are as I mentioned earlier in the video, so we'll stick on the stories missions for this segment, and for the revolutionary new edition of... Follow the Leader. If I wanted to move around at a snail's pace, I'd just play an Assassin's Creed tailing mission. This is Need for Speed, man. Come on. When you get to and complete your race, Anna tells you about the League, who basically just gets all the good stuff in terms of races and cars, the upper echelon to say. While she's still pompous and proud of… we don't know what, I mean we won the last race and she hasn't proven herself at all, she takes us back to the family garage and boasts to Lucas about how he's so boring and that she got 200 views on TikTok or something. Lucas tells her not to be so cocky due to the uprise in aggressive police incidents. 
one that Anna has literally seen with her own eyes at the start of the game. Yet she still feigns ignorance for... there is literally no good reason, she just does. Ah, uh, well I really hope she doesn't have anything bad happen shortly, which makes her learn her less... <laughs> yeah. Bad Cop from earlier is back once again, and look, call me crazy, but Shaw is so comically overacted, it's almost so bad it's good. In a game full of milk toast characters, having one who can just YES OFFICER! See what I mean? It's just hard not to laugh. Anyways, Anna has her car impounded after posting her very illegal racing on the internet in her very distinctive 350Z. I mean, girl, there's no way you didn't see this coming. No one is that oblivious. Shaw can't be asked to take my car though, because then the game wouldn't progress, so we take Anna home so that she can pout and plan her vengeance. When we next meet our law-abiding officer, he's boasting to Good Cop with a trunk full of cash, right outside a restaurant which is sure to have camera and eyes on them. Because yeah, that makes sense. Tor is the good cop, is reasonably upset at all of this, clearly illegal money, and tells Shaw off justifiably. In which he retaliates with the most edgelord ass, two wheels ain't shit against four, <laughs> Like my brother in Christ, what are you talking about? Anyways, he girly pop finger wiggles at her and rips off in his Camaro, which Anna somehow managed to defile while sitting right next to Shaw and Torres. Lemon worst rain officers in history, this. Anna's sure to have learned her lesson by this point, so she- Oh god, it's so stupid every time I get here. She steals the family Camaro to try and get back into the league, but gets caught by Shaw. Of course. I will say, it's pretty fun to have some story missions which are more than just the standard events with some dressing on them. This one letting you take out Shaw while Anna trying her hardest to escape. All thanks to the player, Shaw not only gets taken down, but all that cash that he for some reason kept in his trunk gets exposed on live TV, giving the police a justifiably bad rap. The Camaro though, yeah, it's seen better days. And while Lucas is lamenting over their lineage's beaten wheels, Anna brags about what she's done, which is literally nothing. GameCube did all of the work for her, <laughs> hello? Lucas is pissed. And yeah, good, she deserves it. And guess what? Anna still finds a way to chew out Lucas, who is 100% in the right about everything, and she storms off. Good lord, what is this game? GameCube still feels obligated to help Anna out. Why? Who knows at this point, but it seems to be working as our favor as Taurus reaches out and wants to have a little meeting with us. And since she already despises the police that she's working with, she gives us a hint on a spot which will give us the lowdown on what's going behind the scenes. Oh, I hope you like tailing missions because we have not one, not two, but three in one. Hell yeah! The most engaging game design you'll ever play. This trail leads us to a secret shop shop where, oh damn, the cops have been stealing racers cars and shipping them off to, uh, we don't know, probably the same place that Nigerian prince who offered me my $10,000 came from. Still waiting for that money by the way. My potential scams aside, Anna comes up with a actually relatively solid plan for once, to grab as much attention and cameras as possible street racing, and then drag them all the way down to the chop shop to expose the corruption. It's a bit ambitious, but considering she has had a complete negative effect on the story so far, it's a definite step up. We head back to the Rivera garage to regroup and set up our counterattack, and good lord, this really is straight out of some supervillain movie. Big Bad Mercer tied Lucas, who genuinely has not done anything wrong this entire game. He just supplies cars, which is completely legal, and benefits Mercer as he keeps getting more cars to ship out. So this really is just drama for drama's sake. I mean, they really do pull the whole Corneo, evil villain, divulging plans, which, bro, this isn't rocket science, I don't need it all laid out for me. We literally just saw it. And speaking of myself, notice how every single plot point or moment doesn't revolve around GameCube at all? Your player is just a gateway for these other goober's stories to keep going, which is awful. Makes you wonder why they didn't just let Anna be the playable protagonist this whole time. After his evil spiel, Mercer takes Anna and GameCube in the back of a squad car, but leaves Lucas and his car just chillin' with his keys on the table right next to him. Like, are you dumb? Oh well, I sure hope this doesn't backfire. Well... Now, this being a 1960s Camaro should have genuinely killed Lucas, but no. He wiggles his way over to Mercer, who was in an armored cop car, throws the world's softest punch, which incapacitates Mercer through the will of the plot contrivance gods somehow. Anna runs in, grabs the police computer, and as they all drive off, hits Mercer with the mandatory cheesy one-liner. Look, I, I can't even get mad, man. It's just so needless and dumb, I can't not find it hilarious. 
Now obviously, after causing this much of a scene, we'll have to lay low and not draw too much attention to ourselves. And we need to be stealthy in order to find the password for the police computer regardless. So what does Anna get? The shoutiest RWB993 you can possibly imagine. Dude, this chick can do whatever she wants and just gets zero consequences. Holy shit. Imagine ruining your family garage and heirloom and just being gifted a Porsche. Great messaging game. The world's largest coincidence then commences after giving Lana Lucas's friends a call and she just so happens to have a software chilling on her iPhone which can hack and decode through the computer's password. Sure man. And of course, protocol which has serious software she just bare drops it to GameCube, who then shoots it on over to Anna. Pro what? So computer hacked, which for some reason has to be done while driving? Like, they couldn't just hack safely at the garage? No, 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 they gotta do it while driving. I guess it's so that Torres can pick it up after they throw it out the window and just look at it. Again, genuinely, what is the purpose of these scenes? At last, the police force has been accused of corruption and their public image is forever tainted. But Mercer is nowhere to be found. Oh, well, let's go on down to the docks and check on his perfectly legal car exporting scheme and... When we'll Need for Speed stop using this goddamn car for fan service? Like for real, look, I love Most Wanted to Death as well, but guys, we are decades past it. Move on. After the world's easiest chase, we take down Mercer. He gets a gun pointed at him. Torres gets promoted to police chief, and Anna gets gifted the family Camaro and forgiven by her brother. The end. Wait, what? Yeah, no, seriously, it ends that abruptly. So, what exactly was the vision for this story? Do stupid shit, get caught, get forgiven, and get gifted like nothing ever happened? I'm not against cheesy or campy stories in these games, far from it. But please, for the love of God, make them not only make sense, but have something in it for the player. Being second fiddle to Anna the Brat was such a strange design choice, and it deflects what made stories like Most Wanted, which, let's be honest, they're not blummin' masterpieces by any shot. But you the player can at least be in the shoes of the protagonist and head that journey for your own sake. To regroup everything that I've gone over in this video, is Heat a bad need for speed? Hell no, far from it. This is the game that out of all three of the Ghost Need for Speed reboot trilogy, bothers me the most. Just because of how incredible it could have been if not limited by the shackles of its past. I love when games take risks. It's why despite Payback's downfalls, I can't help but respect the approach to just go wild and roll with it. Heat though, seemed to promise a game in which looking at now, was never able to properly execute the vision in which sparks of remain. Those sparks poke through, and absolutely, they are great. But it's a damn shame that it could never properly get the chance to shine.